the Olympic Games, the whole world coming together for 16 days to cheer on the best of the best in all of their athletic glory. The Games originated in Greece at the site of Olympia. But did you know that the statue of the god that the Games honored was a wonder of the ancient world? The statue of Zeus at Olympia existed for over 800 years and was a technological feat sculpted by one of the most famous artists of classical Greece, known for none other than the Parthenon in Athens. It drew thousands of pilgrims, and a Roman emperor even tried to steal it, but not without the wrath of the gods coming down upon him first. Can one statue really cause this much fuss? Let's get into it. Olympia was a sacred place of worship in ancient Greece. The area was sacred to Zeus, the king of the gods, and to Mother Earth. It's also home to the home of the Greek gods. Mount Olympus. The temple and altar of Zeus on this site would bring in throngs of pilgrims from all over the Greek world to seek divine intervention for their harvests. They would also come for one very important ritual that was practiced in honor of the god. It was a celebration filled with athletic contests. The Olympics. As a result of this, Olympia was the center of Zeus's worship for over a thousand years. Athletes would gather at Olympia from every part of the known world to watch, though only those who were Greek could participate in the games. It was such an honored tradition that even war would stop between Greek states for the duration of the festival. There are two main stories as to how the Olympics began. One is that King Onomaeus of a small kingdom in the Peloponnese called Pisa was told a prophecy that he would be killed by his son-in-law. So in order for him to prevent this, he insisted that every suitor for his daughter Hippodamea take part in a chariot race against him from Olympia to the temple of Poseidon at Ismia, which is some 80 miles away. The suitors were given a head start, and if they won, they could marry Hippodamea. But if they lost, they'd be dead. 13 came forward, and 13 lost. Oh, that's gotta hurt. But also, dang, Onaeus, you speedy with that chariot of yours. Finally, one last suitor by the name of Pelops came forward. Some say Poseidon intervened in this one. Others say that Pelops bribed Onaeus' groom to remove one of the axles on his chariot and replace it with wax. You can choose to believe whichever story you want because Onaeus crashed and died either way and Pelops became king. It was then believed by many ancient Greeks that that the chariot race and other events that were instituted at Olympia were to commemorate this victory. Others had a different idea and believed that the great Heracles, or Hercules, founded the game in honor of his daddy-o, couldn't keep it in his pants, and created way too many demigods Zeus. Today, thanks to a lot of research, we know that athletic games are often connected with funerary rites as a way to dissipate grief. So at Olympia, the games probably started as a commemorative festival held by the ancient Greeks who lived in the area around the tomb of the great Pelops, which was at the heart of the sacred building complex at Olympia. Poseidon was a big fan of Pelops after all, so we might as well celebrate that guy. But over time, the emphasis changed to focus on Zeus, and the whole thing was much less about Pelops. Archaeologists have been excavating at Olympia since 1829, and they found a lot of religious monuments intermingled with buildings dedicated for all those sporty activities. Olympia itself wasn't a town or city, it was an actual shrine that had buildings clustered around it for the pilgrimage to worship and take part in the games. A source I read about this said to think of Olympia as a mix between Mecca and Wembley, which I think is a really great comparison. Such an interesting mix. It would have been wild to be there back in the day. The earliest buildings at Olympia were made of wood and mud brick, but were later replaced with stone. The most marvelous stone building, of course, was the Temple of Zeus. The temple was built between 466 and 456 BCE. The architect was Libon from Elis, and he chose a local stone that was filled with a lot of fossil shells, which is very fitting for the god of nature. The style was popular in southern Greece at the time and was made of the Doric style, 
very similar to the Parthenon. The temple building's purpose was to protect the sacred cult image from the outside world, and this image was an object that represented the presence of Zeus in the inner sanctuary. All of the actual worshipping stuff, like sacrifices, took place at the altar outside of this temple. In the beginning, and for quite a while, the new temple built by Liban probably housed a cult image that was some sort of ancient revered piece of wood or stone. But as Olympia became more and more popular, something more impressive was needed for the most impressive god in all of the land. I mean, people are coming for the spectacle, so you got to give them the spectacle. The council at Elis, the city that Olympia's jurisdiction fell under, chose Phidias as their main man to create a new statue of Zeus. Phidias already sculpted two statues for the Acropolis, the 10 meter high Athena that was in the open air, and the cult image of Athena that would have stood inside the Parthenon. He also may have worked on the infamous Parthenon marbles, but was forced to leave Athens in disgrace in 438 or 437 BCE because he was accused of embezzling gold that was provided to make the statues of Athena. While in Athens, Phidias developed a new technique to build huge statues made out of ivory plates and gold built over a wooden frame that were called a chryselephantine. I think I said that right. Apparently, when ivory is soaked in vinegar, it became pliable, and he was able to mold it onto the wooden frame using terracotta molds. Once the ivory was dry, it returned to its original hardness while keeping its shape. So the first thing Phidias did was build a wooden framework in the temple where the statue would be housed that would fit the finished statue. Then, in his workshop on site, thin plates of ivory were carved for the body, and gold and other precious metals were cast and molded for the drapery and other details. All of these pieces were then put together and the seams were camouflaged until the statue became one solid looking impressive figure of a powerful, probably scary god. I don't know, Zeus is... Zeus is scary to me. Phidias himself didn't leave us any documents to tell us what his inspiration for the statue was or what he modeled his statue after, but in 97 CE, over 400 years after the statue was built, an orator named Diochrysostom performed a speech at the temple and told the story of a legend that says when Phidias was asked what inspired him with his design and creation, he answered that he portrayed Zeus as he was described in Book 1 of Homer's Iliad. It was a phrase that describes Zeus as austere, a god who, with a simple move of his head, caused the whole of Mount Olympus to quake. Dio Chrysostom goes on to express what qualities of Zeus this quote might evoke, such as father and king, protector of cities, god of hospitality, and giver of increase. According to him, one glance at the statue would make you forget all of your earthly troubles. I feel like we need one of those nowadays. Essentially, from all of this, we can get an idea that this statue struck awe into the hearts of those who saw it, and it felt as if Zeus himself was in the room with them. Which again, for me, would be pretty scary. It's yeah, pretty scary. The statue doesn't exist today, but we do have a lot of mini representations of it on coins and some written descriptions from people who lived while the statue was still in all of its glory in Olympia. Strabo, who lived in the first century, wrote, The statue is made of ivory and it is of such size that although the temple itself is very large, the sculptor may be criticized for not having appreciated the correct proportions. He has shown Zeus seated, but with the head almost touching the ceiling, so that we have the impression that if Zeus moved to stand up, he would unroof the temple. Clearly, Strabo thought that the statue was just too big. We do have a Roman gem with a depiction of the statue, and it definitely looks all cramped up and smushed up in there. Just to get an idea as to how big it was, we have the approximate measurements from a poem written about 200 years after it was constructed by Callimachus. We also have some great measurements from archeological excavations. The base was 6.65 meters wide, almost 10 meters deep and one meter high. And the statue, including the base, was over 13 meters tall. That's as high as a three-story house, my friends. This thing was super tall. Pausanias, who was a geographer and writer in the second century CE, gave us quite the vivid description of what the statue looked like. He wrote, On his head lies a sculpted wreath of olive sprays. 
On his right hand, he holds a figure of victory made from ivory and gold. In his left hand, the god holds his scepter inlaid with every kind of metal, and the bird perched on the scepter is an eagle. The sandals of the god are made of gold, as is his robe, and his garments are carved with animals and with lily flowers. The throne is decorated with gold and with precious stones with ebony and with ivory. Zeus rested his very fancy gold gilded feet on a footstool that was decorated with a relief of an Amazonaki, which is a mythological battle between the Greeks and the Amazons. The throne that Zeus sat on was also extensively decorated with sphinxes, more winged figures of victory, and a scene of the gods Apollo and Artemis shooting down all of Niobe's children, which is another Greek myth that I think is supposed to teach you to not really brag about being super fertile and having lots of children to a goddess who only had two of them. Phidias also included another scene, one of Pentarches, who was the winner of the boys wrestling event at the 86th Olympiad, who was said to have been Phidias's lover. Ooh, damn, we love a good hidden love story captured forever in stone. It's the dream. He apparently also carved Pentarches' beautiful into Zeus's little finger. This is the ultimate example of if they wanted to, they would, my friends. Never settle for less than a partner. Pausanias also mentions that there are four columns underneath the throne in addition to the four original legs, which were probably for extra support, but we see no imagery of them on any of the coins that have the statue on it. And I mean, Understandably, you can only fit so much onto the detail of such a tiny surface. The space underneath the throne was also said to have been blocked off by paintings created by Panenus. None of these survive today, but some depicted the labors of Hercules, and others were chosen to reflect the architectural sculptures that decorated the exterior wall of the temple. This whole statue sounds very fancy and very impressive. Apparently, the statue was so good that when Phidias prayed to Zeus to show him a sign as to whether the statue was to his liking, a thunderbolt immediately struck the floor of the temple. If that ain't approval, I don't know what is. Zeus wasn't the only fan. The statue was an immediate success and was admired as a masterpiece of classical Greek sculpture. In 1958, the German Archaeological Institute found Phidias's workshop just outside the main sanctuary wall, and they found two rubbish dumps that contained tools that would have been used to work on sculptures, discarded cores of ivory, fragments of metal and glass, and even terracotta molds that were used for the creation of the gilded drapery. These dumps dated to the 430s BCE and later, so it's without a doubt that this is the workshop where the statue of Zeus was created. It's not like the base of a broken drug inscribed with the phrase, I belong to Phidias, that was found that was, you know, the obvious giveaway. But hey, it's still really nice to get this whole picture. The statue was cared for by people called burnishers, and it was constantly coated with olive oil. Okay, Pausanias says this was done in order to protect the ivory that was probably getting damaged and cracking as a result from the damp environment of the Altus Grove, where the temple was located. A little reservoir was created in front of the statue to act as a reflecting pool, which made it look even larger. Look at that ingenuity coming out of necessity. The oil couldn't protect it forever, unfortunately. And in the second century BCE, Damophan, a sculptor from Messini, mended it. And this is where those four extra columns under the throne might have come from. Precautionary measures. As a conservator, I love to see it. People were so obsessed with this Zeus that even 450 years after it was completed, the Roman Emperor Caligula decided that he wanted it to come to Rome, probably so he could be a lot closer to it. But Zeus bends to no man. The story goes that when the craftsmen sent to transport it arrived at the temple to start bringing it back, the statue suddenly emitted such a cackle of laughter that the scaffolding collapsed and Understandably, all the workmen fled. I watch scary movies all the time, and you can guarantee that I would not be hanging around to see what would happen next. 
Nuh-uh. So Zeus lived to fight another few centuries in Olympia. But when Emperor Theodosius banned the practice of picking cults and closed all the temples, the Olympic Games ended and the sanctuary of Zeus fell into disuse. After this, the statue of Zeus, who was over 800 years old at this point, was transported to a palace in what was then known as Constantinople, which is Istanbul today. Theodosius' workshop in Olympia was turned into a Christian church, and the now empty temple was severely damaged by fires in 425 and in the 6th century CE. The whole area itself was destroyed by landslides, earthquakes, and floods, and that was the end of Olympia. While the statue of Zeus was spared from looting and all of those natural disasters in Olympia, in 462 CE, a huge fire swept through Constantinople and destroyed the palace that the statue was now living in. It's kind of crazy to think or wonder that if the statue stayed in its home in Olympia, that even though it would have probably been looted and stripped of all of the gold and precious things, that we could have possibly found some fragments in the archaeological remains of the temple. Ironic, isn't it? How cruel history can be sometimes. Regardless, while the Statue of Zeus might not have been the largest of the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, I think you and I can agree that this is one of the most impressive, both for its technological ingenuity and its overall beauty that instilled wonder and awe into all who saw it. That was Ancient Wonder number three of seven. If you liked the video, go ahead and smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well so you don't miss out on the rest of the Ancient Wonders plus another bonus video at the end, like last week's bonus video. Ooh, exciting. Big thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. They're the ones who voted to have this series on this channel. And if you'd like to have your say in what videos I put out next, as well as get some other cool stuff along the way while supporting the channel, if you find value in it, then head on over to Patreon via the link in my bio. Each and every one of you is so important in making the YouTube dream come true. Even a like and subscribe go a really long way, and I want you to know that I love you all. Stay dirty, my friends.